prolific scholar and public intellectual whose work focuses on issues of ethnic identity and inequality with an emphasis on Hawaii. And his work covers a range of topics including Chinese American civics organizations, educational employment inequality, and his recent book from Race to Ethnicity Interpreting Japanese American Experiences in Hawaii, uh, which is a history of Japanese American political power here in Hawaii. So with uh, Professor Candice Pushkai, John Cohen edited the anthology Asian Settler Colonialism. He is also the author of Ethnicity and Inequality in Hawaii, which was published by Temple University Press in 2008. And his articles have recently been featured in Patterns of Prejudice, Amerasia, Ethnic and Racial Studies, and Social Process in Hawaii. So, and I feel like all of my students have taken a class with John. <laughs> um, so uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. John Cohen. John, 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 do you need the smart, the smart board? No, no, I, I have to read it. I'll try to read it on the money. I'll turn it off and back either. I'm coming. As I said, I wasn't really expecting this. It's much of a turnout, so I'm glad to see all of you here. I have a lot of questions. I'd like to thank Brian for organizing this program and putting together the flyer and publicizing my talk on campus. I also need to make some. Uh, um, Comments live. I guess Friday, not last week, we had an open house here. Rod introduced me to some very nice things. Rod Labrador back there. I shouldn't have then. <laughs> well, they, they were well deserved. <laughs> <laughs> the reason I couldn't uh, reciprocate I was uh, I have this affliction, which is the same uh, as well, one of the Never known film by Alfred Hitchcock. <laughs> Some of you might be thinking of Psycho. Yeah. So it's actually vertical. <laughs> <laughs> I had a hard time standing up at, uh, for extended periods that uh, Friday, but it's just getting better. Um, but I want, so that's the reason why I didn't say some nice things about Rod. <laughs> so, you know, for a long time, as you said, you know, it was on his master's uh, in Philippine studies, and he. Um, wrote this thesis in which he came up with this Amiga model of Igorot ethnicity. Wasn't that that it? Right? Yes, yeah, something like that. Yeah. <laughs> wow, this guy's going to go places with this guy. It's a theoretical model. And uh, subsequently, of course, he did his field research here on um, the Filipino community. And I, I had many conversations because uh, I also did contemporary ethnography, like Tai Tu, as anthropologist here. And uh, I was very pleased to read his book manuscript and look forward to his book finally coming out. I like to give him that I submitted my manuscript before his, and somehow you had press got it out before his book is coming out in January of next year. So we look forward to that. Quality before pace. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I also want to mention uh, Christine Penwell, Rod's uh, better half, who I also was on her master's degree committee in American studies sometime in the 1990s. And just last May she finished her PhD in higher ed administration and I was on the defense by Skype in uh, Tokyo at the uh, Sophia University Library. And you know, I've been encouraging her to get some articles from it because she really did a great job on it. Uh, there are some real insights she did in terms of the intersection of ethnicity, class, and gender based on these interviews she did with um, local Filipino women from low-income families who were able to obtain college degrees in uh, UA. So, uh, Brian, please invite Christine to give a talk next semester. Yep. Okay. Hi, Dick. Hi. Dick is one of those I quoted a lot my book in the chapter of Japanese American political power, maybe you can contribute some, some of your insights to um, as we discuss that. So uh, as the um, flyer for my talk said, uh, there are two different issues that I'll discuss today based on some of the issues I raised in my book. One is the, the overall argument about this historical transition from uh, race to ethnicity in Hawaii, which isn't limited to Japanese Americans. It's something that I would say is uh, characteristic of Hawaii society as a whole, although I, I will mention, if I can remember, some of the ways in which Japanese-American experiences uh, 
highlight that transition. The other issue I'll bring up is um, the maintenance of Japanese American political power over time. Since, well, particularly since 1986, when Mario Shiba left office, and, and, uh, one of the things that I argue is actually that it's not that important. I don't believe for Japanese Americans to maintain that political power and apply that to the 2014 elections this year, and I would say it explains why, one of the reasons why Hanabusa lost, for example, and the economy of Ashton. So let me go to the first part, this, this transition from race to ethnicity. As I said, I have to sit down because sometimes things start to get wobbly. All right. So prior to World War II, I, I think it's pretty clear that race undoubtedly was the dominant principle of uh, social organization here in the white structure maintained the highly unequal social relations between, on the one hand, holidays, and on the other hand, non holidays So this is how I use race, ethnicity, as organizing principles of social relations. The structure, uh, particularly unequal access to occupation, income, and uh, education. And both ethnicity and race are social constructions. That's another assumption I make, in the same way that class and gender are also social constructions. So, but going back to this historical period, when if we think of race as the primary organizing principle, what this means is that the primary boundary, political, economic, social boundary in Hawaii was between those two groups, holidays and non holidays, and this was demarcated and enforced by race, but in effect holidays because of the greater power that they wielded such that they could insist that race was the dominant principle between themselves and other groups, as opposed to other kinds of possible principles like equality of opportunity. But that obviously was not the case in Hawaii prior to World War II. If I can get this to move. Now, I think I'm going next to the, um, the... So one of the arguments I make, and this is something I'll refer to ethnicity subsequently, is during this historical period prior to World War II, race worked for holidays. Because they could make it work for them, and race worked against non-holidays. Um, evident in the very restricted access they had to employment, education, and other social opportunities. So indicative of this uh, prominence of racial discourse at this time, Hawaii's constituent groups were referred to as races, as in the Hawaiian race, the Japanese race. Um, this is by academics, journalists, laypersons. Uh, one of the projects I'm working on now is a book on the Fukunaga case, it's very common during this period where people are talking about race in Hawaii, how to this was not a racial crime. I'm talking about Japanese as a race themselves. But things change after the war in the immediate uh, post-war period because of the economic, political forces that were unleashed that eventually resulted in organized and successful challenges to the overall dominance of holidays and consequently of race as the principal regulator of social relations. So, of course, I think that most of you are familiar with Hawaii history, you know what I'm talking about. On the economic front, we have the labor movement led by the International Longshoremen's and Warehousemen's Union, the ILWU, which uh, in the first few years after the war had organized some 35,000 workers in the three major industries of sugar, pineapple, and longshore. This enabled these predominantly non-white workers in these unions to contest the power wielded by the holiday rule big five company that dominated the economy, not just in sugar and pineapple, but in terms of transportation, uh, communication, manufacturing, uh, retail, wholesale trade, inter island shipping, etc. So this holiday, this challenge to holiday supremacy was especially evident in the 1946 strike. The first multiracial and also territory-wide strike in the island. Among the gains made by the ILWU, besides the significant pay increase, was the end to racial discrimination against the members of the union. 
this is a very significant achievement. This is 18 years before the Civil Rights Act of 64 that banned racial discrimination. But 1946, the union already was demanding that in that contract. This, um, the other issue I, I think that the union raised in this period of organizing was they essentially created race-based affirmative action. This resulted because of anti-Filipino racism in the Union. The unwillingness of Japanese, especially, is the second largest group in the Union. Uh, Portuguese and other members of the ILWU not to support Filipino candidates for Union positions. Viewing them as uh, uneducated, unqualified to hold office in the Union. So a directive was made out of San Francisco that particularly Japanese Americans, the second largest in the Union, Nisei for the most part, should step aside and allow our Filipino brothers to be elected to these positions. Because the Union recognized that Filipinos, as the majority of its members, needed to hold these leadership positions or else the rank and file wouldn't support the Union when they went on strike, as they consequently did, as I'll point out in quick succession over the next 12 years. So, following the 46th strike, we have pineapple strikes, longshore strikes, sugar strikes again in 1958. This is one I can remember. Great was that. Third or fourth grade in Mali, you know, going by the plantation fields and then the seniors, nobody working out there. Um, but by the next year, 1959, years later, ILW had 70,000 members. No, by far, I don't think there's even been a union with that many members in Hawaii. If you add the spouses of these 70,000 members, and it's not necessarily 70,000, but it's well over 100,000, you get a sense of the power of the union at that time, especially when they got directly involved in voting in um, support of Democratic candidates, which occurred in 54, especially. No? So that's the major political event, 1954 so-called democratic revolution, in which Democrats gain control both houses of the territorial legislature for the first time, and they've been in control of it since then. But what they did was embark on this legislative agenda that fostered racial equality and economic reform in Hawaii, such things as greater funding for the public schools, expansion of the UH system to the labor islands through the community colleges. Uh, they lower tuition at UH Manoa. Um, I used to say to students, this will never happen again, but it might, right? For the Board of Regions, which sends a 7.5% tuition increase that's supposed to kick in you know, next fall, so we may actually see something uh, in those lines. But they also did other things such as abolish capital punishment. 1957, when it was still a territory, um, provided increased welfare benefits and other social services uh, to Hawaii residents, established the progressive tax rate schedule as opposed to the flat rate tax that was uh, used by the Republicans. And with the additional funds is how they were able to finance all those changes that they um, brought about. But what has to be kept in mind is both these social movements are predominantly non-white in um, membership, the ILWU and the Democratic Party, although in terms of leadership, the ILWU and the party also had substantial numbers of colleagues. Uh, Jack Hall is the regional director, for example, of the ILWU, and the other Jack Burns as head of the Democratic Party. So, as a result of these movements, starting in the 1950s, local Japanese, local Chinese started differentiating themselves from other non-white groups as they gained increasing political and economic power. You know? um, differentiating themselves from, say, Native Hawaiians, Portuguese Americans, Filipino Americans, groups with which they had worked together very closely in the ILWU and the Democratic Party. Chinese Americans actually had become a middle class group by World War II. Local Japanese joined them sometime in the 1960s, 
as a result of the post state boom here in Hawaii, um, and with, which resulted in tourism becoming the dominant industry by, by the early 60s. But together with the breakdown of the dominant racial boundaries separating holidays and non holidays the latter groups began to view themselves, I would argue, and other groups in Hawaii, more as ethnic groups with differing cultures than as, as races with different phenotypes, and I'll elaborate on this later. By the 1970s, I would argue ethnicity had replaced race as the foremost principle of social organization in Hawaii. This transition is especially evident in the stratification order, in which we find ethnicity rather than race, that, uh, which regulates access to occupational income and edu uh, educational status. This is something I've looked at very closely over the years, beginning with um, 1970 census data to the most recent 2010. And I would argue that ethnicity explains the kinds of changes that we find in ways that race cannot. And in fact, I would say the, the major change from 1970 in the ethnic stratification order is that Japanese Americans became one of the dominant groups along with Chinese Americans and whites by 1990 in terms of similarity of educational, occupational, and income status, while on the other hand, other major groups like Hawaiians and uh, Filipinos and Samoans have been kept in their subordinate status. We, we don't see evidence of much collective mobility over time among those groups. There certainly has been individual mobility, but not collective mobility on the scale of Japanese Americans, Chinese Americans, and we could also argue Korean Americans. The Korean American experience also is one of some um, degree of change, but it's downward mobility. In the 1970s, Korean Americans had the highest income of all groups in Hawaii, higher than whites. But with the arrival of post 65 immigrants in substantial numbers, that socioeconomic status declined, particularly as a result of Korean immigrant women being employed in service work, and other uh, Korean immigrants also, uh, given our dependence on tourism, uh, which creates, obviously, low wage, low mobility, low security jobs that cannot, cannot provide significant avenues for socioeconomic mobility. So ethnicity as the foremost structural principle, you know, com comparing to race historically, works for the benefit of Japanese Americans, Chinese Americans, and whites. You know, because as the most powerful groups in Hawaii, politically, economically, they can insist that ethnicity is the dominant principle organizing social relations here, rather than, I said, alternative kinds of principles that can foster greater uh, equality in Hawaii. Ethnicity, though, works against Filipinos, Hawaiians, Samoans, and other ethnic minorities in the way that race did in the past, but not to the same restrictive uh, degree. There are still possibilities for mobility in Hawaii, but at the individual level. Not so much collective uh, mobility as we saw historically for Japanese, Chinese, Koreans uh, moving off the plantations. Now, besides ethnic inequality, I would also say we can see ethnicity as the dominant principle uh, in the social construction of Hawaii's constituent groups, as ethnic groups rather than as races. And as I said, we accept races a social construction, so is ethnicity. And the reason that people in Hawaii construct themselves into these different ethnic categories is because they consider their cultural differences as more significant to distinguish themselves from one another than their phenotypic or racial differences. In actuality, except for groups like Filipino Americans, Korean Americans, in which there are, which they have sizable immigrant segments, uh, these cultural differences among Hawaii's different groups have diminished substantially. 
as these groups have acculturated to local and American cultures and have lost much of the traditional culture, for example, uh, language and religion. The high rate of interethnic marriage in Hawaii, now about 45% roughly, is an indication of these cultural differences not necessarily being that significant, such that they would bar people from different groups intermarrying with each other. But, as I said, since ethnicity, like race, is socially constructed, the actual nature of these cultural differences is less significant than their perception and representation, and it's those latter considerations that result in the construction of ethnic rather than racial categories in Hawaii. So, besides ethnic inequality and the social construction of Hawaii's groups, peoples rather, as belonging to different ethnic groups, another um, example I would give about the lesser significance of race is evident in the lesser construction of racial categories and the assertion, lesser assertion of racial identities that otherwise are very prevalent in the continental U.S. Uh, most significantly, these racial categories include Asian American and Pacific Islander, who Together, these groups would comprise the majority of Hawaii's population. So let's uh, look at some reasons for this. And I would say it's because Hawaii's people are very familiar with the cultural and social differences among these various groups in both the Asian American and Pacific Islander racial categories, such as those between Filipino Americans and Korean Americans, or between Native Hawaiians and Samoans, and hence they do not racialize these groups and their individual members into these larger aggregate racial categories such as Asian American or uh, Pacific Islander, as commonly is the case in the U.S. continent. Besides culture, Hawaii's people are also knowledgeable about other significant differences among ethnic groups here, such as their socioeconomic and political status, their historical experiences, and this also results in the lesser racialization of these groups into larger racial categories. So people know that here, know that Native Hawaiians are the indigenous people of the islands that we once had their own independent kingdom. Therefore, they differ substantially in political and legal status from uh, Samoans, Tongans, and Micronesians, and unlike in the continental America, then these groups are not socially constructed as Pacific Islanders, although this term might be used by academics and journalists. What I've been especially struck by the past, oh, I don't know, maybe the past year, I've become more aware of these anti-Micronesian jokes is the way that they really target Micronesians specifically in ways that are completely different from other small Pacific Islander minorities in Hawaii, like Tongans or Samoans. You know? The content of these jokes aren't generalizable to other Pacific Islander groups here. They're really focused on the Micronesian uh, experience. Now, I will admit, there are two notable exceptions to what I've been saying about how Hawaii's ethnic groups are, well, they are ethnic groups rather than race. And, and the first exception would be African Americans. Uh, uh, there's no question they're viewed primarily in racial terms, based on phenotypic differences with others. The other example, I would say, is Hollywood. Um, here, I would you know, I, I've done some rethinking about this. And I, I, I think it, I've been influenced especially by acts of anti holy violence in Hawaii. Where I think, you know, if you take the Didi case, for example, how it started with uh, the comments made to Michael Perrin and the McDonald's in Korea. To me, holidays are also perceived as a racial group here, based on phenotype. At the same time, though, there are these significant cultural differences between holidays and local people that mark them as very different from others here. Now, historically, this was Hawaii Creole of Pigeon English. 
clearly was a marker of, uh, for local people who spoke uh, pidgin. You know, growing up, I knew very few Japanese American friends of mine who did not speak pidgin. The reason they did not was because both of the parents were college educated, which I suppose was just not the case for the great majority of my friends. I also had a Filipino American friend who didn't speak pidgin because his father was in, was on a plantation where his father had a white collar job on the plantation, and he did not want his son to suffer the negative consequences of the stereotyping of Filipinos that was so prevalent in the white at that time. So my friend Demetrio, he even wore shoes to school, which most of us didn't do at that time. But it was because of his father did not want to be treated like a Filipino plantation worker, and he did not want that for his son either. So Demetrio did not speak pigeon. As I said, these are the kinds of exceptions that otherwise would uh, distinguish holidays from local people. Okay, so in general, these kinds of ways in which holidays uh, are differently constructed, or holiday identity is differently constructed in Hawaii, uh, show how being holiday in Hawaii is very different from being white on the continent. Right? It's not purely based on race. Okay, let's turn to the other issue, um, the maintenance of political power. This is a chapter I have in uh, my book um, referring to the post-1986 situation. After Ariyoshi left the governor's office after three terms, uh, the argument I make in that chapter is, you know, at, at this point in Japanese American history, I don't think Japanese American, or the Japanese American community necessarily seeks to maintain its political power over other ethnic groups. I, I think this is less the case at the state legislature, but more so when we look at the higher status offices like the governor's office or uh, congressional offices. So I would apply this argument to why Colleen Hanabusa was defeated. One of the things I noticed from the ballot this year, I don't know if anyone noticed it, but her middle name appeared, her middle Japanese name. I had never seen it previously in any of her campaign advertising, certainly not on the ballot when she ran for Congress. So, Colleen Hanabusa's middle name is Wakako. Anybody know that? Well, obviously, it was one of those ways, especially Japanese American women like Jean Sadako King, appeal to Japanese American voters. Right? And there are different ways that is just my chapter how this takes place, uh, including by non-Japanese who have Japanese-American spouses, uh, our mayor, and of course, Ed Case, who <laughs> is the most blatant example of using your Japanese-American wife and say, vote for me, I'm a Japanese-American wife. <laughs> okay? Now, you recall, Colleen Hanabusa lost by less than 1,800 votes. No? So, the argument could be made, if 1,800 Japanese Americans in Hawaii had voted for her, she would be the next senator from Hawaii, because the Republican candidate is obviously not terribly competitive. No? That's all it would have taken. Uh, she lost by 0.7% of the total number of votes cast. There were some 235 so 234,000 votes cast in the primary for U.S. Senators. This was actually less than in the governor's race in 2010, 240,000. Very competitive race between Abercrombie and Ruthie Hanneman. So even though this is a very significant election that everyone knew, whoever wins the Democratic primary is going to be the next senator from Hawaii, there still was less of a turnout than uh, four years ago, although that was the governor's race. It wasn't um, for the Senate. But percentage-wise, of the roughly 689,000 registered voters in Hawaii, turnout was only 42%. Very consistent with what it has been 
for the past several elections, um, same as in 2012, and less than in 2010, 43%. Yeah. This tends to be the case in Hawaii. We have very low turnout for both the primary and general election, and the lowest in the nation in some of the cases. But in this primary, again, if Japanese Americans, I would argue, really thought it was important to have Hanabusa succeed in Oi and the CDL for more than almost 50 years, they could have voted for her. And it wouldn't take, this wouldn't have been significantly more than the 42% turnout, right? 1,800 votes. But people obviously, to me, didn't really care that much. And so they didn't turn out and vote for her. The low registration and voting rates in Hawaii contrast with how Japanese Americans are perceived as having the highest registration and voting rates. I've never seen any data to prove this is the case, but this is something that's generally accepted. So it makes that 42% of voters, the 1,800 votes by which Hanabusa lost, even more significant if it's viewed in the context of the higher registration voting rates for Japanese Americans. Another way besides uh, voting that one could say Japanese Americans weren't especially concerned that Hanabusa succeed in OA is Schatz raised $4.9 million compared to Hanabusa's $2.9 million. Obviously, people could have contributed more. Uh, the HGEA endorsed Schatz. Even though a plurality of members of the HGEA, the Hawaii Government Employees Association, are Japanese American. 42,000 members, the largest union in Hawaii. Hmm? It's not so much the votes that might come from the endorsements, though, it's the contributions to the campaign that allowed Chats to run those ads much more frequently than Hanabusa did. Hmm? Now, you might say, well, okay, that's just one primary election. What other examples are there historically of Japanese American candidates who did not receive substantial Japanese American support when they ran for office? Well, I would go back to 1990, Pat Psyche, although she was a Republican, you know, as opposed to other Japanese American candidates who were primarily Democrats. She challenged Dan Akaka in the race for the U.S. Senate. This is the seat that Spark Matsunaka used to hold until he uh, died in office and then Danny Akaka was appointed to succeed him. Um, she lost in that election. A lot of people believe that uh, she was going to win because she had been a two-term representative in Congress and she was supposedly going to receive Japanese American votes. She also lost four years later when she ran against Kayatani in the governor's race. Again, a race that people predicted that she would win with Japanese American support. Um, other examples in governor's races, Maisie Hirono in 2002, running against uh, Linda Lingle. Linda Lingle won that election with 2,000 fewer votes than when she lost in 1998 to Kayatana. And one explanation for why Maisie Hirono lost is that she didn't receive significant Japanese American support, evident in lower voter turnout in Japanese American communities like Manoa, Kamuki, uh, Pearl City. Randy Iwasa, he was absolutely swamped 2006 when he ran against Linda Lingle. Linda Lingle was unbeatable that year, I believe. She raised the most money in any campaign in Hawaii, more than $6 million. Randy Iwasa resurfaced this year as ever Congress campaign manager. I can't, I can't believe that to uh, him after uh, how Randy Iwasa lost. Um, there has never been a, mayor, a Japanese American mayor of Honolulu. I don't know if long term uh, residents realize this. Uh, but in uh, 2008, Japanese Americans had the opportunity to elect the first Japanese American mayor of Honolulu. Well, actually, they had in 1984 too, with Pat Shinnick. 
and Kobayashi, city council members, to the still, still yet, long term member of the state legislature. She ran against Mufi Hanneman. Uh, Mufi supposedly had twice as many Japanese American votes as Ann Kobayashi did. He, he was seeking re election. Maybe that gave him the advantage. But uh, again, just being Japanese American doesn't necessarily mean Japanese Americans are going to vote for you. Yeah? I, I, no doubt, Japanese Americans engage in block voting, but every group in Hawaii and the continental U.S. engages in block voting. For Japanese Americans, I would say the limit when it comes to block voting is voting for Republicans. And Pat Psyche would probably attest to this. Just because someone is Japanese American does not mean that they're going to vote for them, especially if they're Republican. Uh, there have been a lot of Japanese American candidates up in Manoa, and Jeff will agree with me. There's a majority Japanese American community there. Running as Republicans, they've lost to non Japanese, like Ed Case, or uh, our mayor, Caldwell, who held that office uh, for a while, too. So when it comes to the governor's office, there hasn't been one elected a Japanese American since 82. When Ariyoshi was elected to his third term, uh, but in 74 and his re-election in 78, I think in those cases, Japanese Americans considered really important to elect the first Japanese American. <coughs> and I'll come back to that. But for the 2014 election, I was surprised uh, when I found out he could raise only $550,000. I thought the Okinawan community itself would contribute half a million dollars. Huh? Kenny's, Zippy's, Rainbow Drive-In, where are the kind of, uh, uh, Kapalula Avenue's got a lot of these Okinawan restaurants, um, on a Hawaiian food. Yeah, I was trying to find out, well, what's the Okinawa community doing now for Ige? Are they contributing money to this campaign? I haven't been able to determine that. But, my God, you, it, it, Abercrombie raised 10 times more than uh, Ige did. Huh? Uh, but nonetheless, he did win. Okay? But going back to when Ariyoshi ran for governor, I would say it mattered a lot more in those two elections, 74 and 78, for Japanese Americans to elect a Japanese American government, especially the first time. Yeah? Um, the 78 election, when he ran for, when he ran for re-election, Ariyoshi organized the largest political rally in the history of Hawaii. I don't know if some of you remember this, a little stadium, 50,000 people turned out for entertainment, free uh, box dinners, um, he had 7,000 volunteers cook the food for those more than 50,000 people who showed up. And about two weeks before the primary, he was running against Frank Fossey. The polls showed that Ariyoshi was behind by 10 percentage points. So Bob Oshiro, who was his campaign manager, who had been Burns as campaign manager for three, uh, his three elections to the governorship and was uh, John Wahe's campaign manager also, subsequent to um, Ariyoshi, uh, had this list that he had developed since running Burns' campaigns of thousands of people who had voted in the past for Democratic candidates. So he contacted the people on those lists had them each contact their friends, relatives, acquaintances. Within a two-week period, they had contacted 100,000 people. This is before social media now. You know, this is like by telephone. And this has been taken as one of the reasons why our issue was able to turn this election around within a two-year period. Again, the mobilization of the community. You know, obviously, of these 100,000 people who aren't all Japanese Americans, but one can assume a uh, substantial proportion were, and the 7,000 volunteers weren't all Japanese American, but nonetheless, uh, very substantial numbers were. I don't think the Japanese American community is organized uh, to that extent anymore. 
So it'd be very difficult to get that kind of uh, support for a Japanese American candidate running for office. Now, another reason I would say it's not that important for Japanese Americans at this point to elect one of their own to these high offices. No? It's because as they've risen in socioeconomic states, to, as I said, one of the dominant groups socioeconomically in Hawaii, it has become less important to maintain their political power. Because families have the financial resources, the wealth, to maintain themselves in that high socioeconomic status, particularly through investing in the education of their children. For some families, this starts with preschool, which is very expensive in Hawaii. You know? And then it, conti it may continue with private school. It may continue with college on the U.S. continent. It may continue also with graduate professional school subsequently. So one of the ways that Japanese American families have uh, made conscious decisions about their wishes for their children and their future, particularly when it comes to education, is to limit the size of families. One or two kids. It's very rare to find, well, I won't say it's rare, it's uncommon to find Japanese American uh, families with three kids. Or you find the example of like my cousin. Two kids already out of college, graduated, working. Third one, about 12 years younger, still, still in high school. Unplanned, right? That's why you get three kids. <laughs> okay, so the last thing I'll point out, you know, I, I, I don't really think it's lamentable if Japanese Americans uh, no longer sustain the political power in Hawaii. Because less Japanese American political power means more power for other minorities like Filipinos, Hawaiians, Samoans. This provides for a more egalitarian, just, open society in Hawaii. I think the society we would like to see. So I'll end there. So we have some extra time for Q&A, so um, we'll just open it up for right now. John. Mr. Brahim. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Uh, very provocative question. Yeah. Uh, thanks for your talk. Uh, I think I was wondering first, I have a couple of questions. I was wondering first whether Iwasi was the Japanese middle name for Abercrombie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, no. Sorry. <laughs> But I see in the uh, rendition for your book is that uh, class uh, comes in and out of uh, your uh, yeah. discussion. So I think, uh, for instance, you say, for instance, the Japanese now, they, especially the elite Japanese or upper middle class, mm -hmm. uh, they don't care much about political power because they figured it out on their own. No, no, I wouldn't say that's only limited to upper middle class. No, no, uh, I'm saying, but you mentioned uh, the elite in your example. But my uh, question is that I wanted to say it's not only the elite, but other Japanese. Oh, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> the other thing uh, I see that needs to be defined is the uh, notion of political power. What do we mean by political mm -hmm. power? If we, see, uh, if we say, for instance, Japanese have... Uh, take like in the 70s, for instance, have more political power than others. What does that mean? Mm -hmm. So it's very important because mm -hmm. my notion of political power would have to uh, deal with like empire, capital, class, therefore, mm -hmm. and so forth. So I think this is something that uh, we need to deal with. <coughs> uh, another thing that might be, uh, that is related actually, is that Rather than say, for instance, and you might want to, we can discuss that later on too. Uh, rather than say, for instance, that at one point it was race, and then it became ethnicity, etc. Uh, might it be a situation that race and ethnicity are layered, right? In the sense that <coughs> Howley versus non Howley at one point was race, right? Mm -hmm. A race thing because they had the power to determine. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, 
in terms of uh, if uh, one way of uh, defining uh, ethnicity is uh, the question of nationality as part of it, you know, nationality, culture, etc., mm -hmm. language. <coughs> uh, you can say uh, that uh, perhaps there's there was like <coughs> an ethnic group called Japanese and then Filipinos, etc., etc. They fought among each other. But also they cooperated, as we know, like say the 1920s, right? They cooperated and then fought, you know, as an example. So I'm thinking about uh, the layering of the notion of ethnicity and race, uh, and then figuring out which one is the more dominant and in what space yeah. is it, you know, mm -hmm. on the uh, <coughs> uh, political power space, as I understand it, would be the Howley are dominant because they have, you know, power to do whatever they wanted to do then. Okay, so I think that is uh, important to think about because also um, what might uh, uh, give some corroboration to this is like there is a historic basis uh, for race or ethnicity in terms of those or either of one uh, or either of them being an organizing principle, mm -hmm. you know. So what is the historic basis for the layered thing where race was more important than ethnicity at some point, but they moved in different spaces, one among the elite, you know, race, but probably ethnicity uh, in terms of cooperation and so forth in the, on the plantations as an example. Mm -hmm. So these are the, some of the things that really triggered uh, my thinking when uh, you were talking about this, and I think it's a great work, and um, look forward to really. Okay, thank you. Well, political power. I have a definition you know, based on one proposed uh, I think 1968 by my uh, PhD advisor, Andrew Smith, in his book Government and Zazal. Power is the ability to influence or control the actions of others. So when I say Japanese Americans are political power, they have that ability, capacity to influence or control the actions of other ethnic groups in Hawaii, you know, through the positions that they occupy, not necessarily in terms of uh, elected office, but things like being on the Board of Regents, making decisions about tuition increases uh, or land use. But one of the things uh, I want to point out, and what I do discuss in my book, it's based on the work that Dick Pratt did. I don't know if Dick's Dick left, but he had to live, right? Dick, Dick wrote this book about government in Hawaii. It came out in 2000. He talked about factionalism in the legislature, which is endemic, which is dated before certainly 2000, continues to the present. So even though almost 40% of the legislators in, in Hawaii are Japanese American, only one Republican, you know, all of them otherwise are Democrats, they're divided into these factions both the Senate and the House. Uh, this is especially evident in the House. You know, I was finalizing my manuscript December 2012. You know, I've been away, right? I was away on sabbatical, following the news. And I, I, I was aware of the, you know, because this has been going on for uh, almost all throughout the 2000s. This faction led by Silvio Luke and what's the other guy's name? Psyche? Scott? Scott Psyche, yeah. They've been trying to get rid of Calvin Clay mm -hmm. for years. Previously, they had ousted Joe Suki as speaker by approaching Calvin Clay and said, hey, Calvin, why don't you run for House Speaker? We'll support you with the votes we have. And that's how Calvin Clay became House Speaker, on the assumption that he would eventually resign and then Sylvia Luke, who got the position of vice speaker, would become speaker or her maybe Scott Wright. But that didn't happen. And then both of them lost those positions that they previously held. So over the years, they're trying to get Calvin Say ousted. And so they're finally successful after the fall 2012 election. And who did they approach? Joe Sufi, 80 years old, voted against the Civil Union's bill, supposedly. This faction led by Sylvia Lou, Scott Saiki, the more progressive, liberal members of the House, Joe Suki. <laughs> He's a nice guy. And then what did Joe Suki do? You recall? 
to guarantee he had the 26 votes to become House Speaker. <coughs> My argument is tractions have nothing to do with political ideology. They're just power grabs. Joe Suki forms a coalition with the Republicans. Seven Republicans. By doing so, he absolutely marginalized those in the former faction led by Calvin Say and Marcos Oshiro, who got zero committee appointments. Even though they previously had been Democratic leaders in the House. So power, when it comes to at least our state legislature, one cannot just go, as Dan Boylan said, numbers do not tell all. It can be very deceiving. Also in the Senate, where there are more factions, one of the differences in the Senate is Senate President and the Chair of the Ways and Means Committee come from different factions. This is the way that the Senate has chosen to minimize the power of the dominant faction that elects the President. This is how Brian Taniguchi, one of our majors and lab leaders formerly, lost his position as Ways and Means Chair, which was one of the ways we got one and a half positions when he held that office. Position, I would say, hey Brian, you know, I've got some position for ethnic studies, so we wrote in the budget for us, and that's how we got them. But he used to belong to a faction headed by Kulin Hanabu, so when she became Senate President, he lost his position. The other one, Butler Larry, no doubt in this period when we're saying that there are, when race was historically dominant, that there was clearly recognition of ethnic differences among groups. No? It doesn't mean that they all thought of themselves as non holiday and, and they didn't necessarily form coalitions either. You know, the 1940s strike, is, you know, only in the mind of Ron Takaki was there a collaboration. <laughs> uh, there were clearly a lot of hostilities towards Japanese during this period as the largest group. But what I'm arguing is, the dominant boundary was one of race. Ethnicity certainly was significant, but it operated at a lower level than at the overall society. I agree with you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, John. I look forward to, to your book. Um, I was struck by the 1946 date that you had for us. That's really an interesting moment in history. Mm -hmm. It made me wonder about the historical specificities of the transformation that we're talking about, mm. specifically the war. Um, mm. It seemed to be some special circumstances that apply, so the interest of Japanese in Hawaii to move towards sort of de -rash rationalized identity. Um, mm -hmm. Do you see any particular place for the, the, uh, the local history of the war here in the story you're telling? Oh, yeah. Martial law, huh? as it applied to everyone here. But, you know, one of the arguments Gary Nukiura has made that, was that martial law is really targeted against Japanese Americans. You know, going back to the 1920s when the uh, military here, John DeWitt, who was a colonel based in Hawaii. John DeWitt would be General John DeWitt at the time of the bombing of Pearl Harbor and would be the one who, uh, head of the Western Defense Command that argued for the internment of Japanese Americans. But going back to the early 1920s when he was based here, he was one of those who planned the Declaration of Martial Law and the limited internment of Japanese aliens in the event of war with Japan. So martial law, even though applied to everyone, was targeted. This is what he was arguing. Targeted against Japanese Americans to contain them because they were viewed as the most threatening uh, group here in Hawaii to great domination. So, during the war, the restrictions on employment, moving to seek other kinds of jobs from island to island, was one of the reasons given for why the ILW was successful after the war, when previously it had been so unsuccessful in organizing on a multiracial basis. The planning of uh, labor organizing began during the latter stages of the war. This is one of the reasons why 
one of the people I dedicate the book is the other Jack in Hawaii history, Jack Kawano. Kawano was um, an ILW official at this point. He had organized dock workers in Honolulu, had them join the ILW in 1941 before the outbreak of World War II. Towards the latter stages of the war, he got the ILW members in um, the dock, among the dock workers to go out to the islands to recruit workers on the plantations into the ILW. This is in the 46th strike put out uh, for the 50th anniversary. Although, of course, in that film, you will not see any reference to Jack Kawano, any picture of Jack Kawano because of his testimony in Congress and uh, many, many members of the Communist Party. The other significant thing that Kawano did during the last stage of the war was he was a member of what Dan Boylan has called the Coffee Drinking Group, you know, with Jack Burns and um, Ernest Murai. Chuck Mao, the only politician among them, and Mitsuyu Kikio, who subsequently was elected to office in 46. But Kawano was the key member because he had the IOW behind him. These other guys were political neophytes except for um, Chuck Mao. You know, Burns would lose several elections before he finally got elected. So again, you find Jack Kawano in these two key areas of these historical moments, of the 46 strike, you know, by then, he was not really part of the LW until he got marginalized. And certainly by 54, he was, well, he was never a Democratic Party official. But he had a very significant role in the rise to power of the party. So, yeah, there is a definite World War II history. I know you're very interested in <coughs> the war uh, related to these two historical moments. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh, Thank you, John very complex tale of Japanese Americans. So I'm trying to understand the argument. Mm -hmm. um, so are you saying that Japanese political power is declining uh, in some ways as mm -hmm. reflected in um, Hanabusa, say, losing, and you're mm -hmm. arguing that if Japanese Americans had block voted, she might have, maybe their voting lines, the lines along which they're voting are changing, right? Well, this we don't. They didn't bother to vote a substantial number. Right, so if they didn't bother because, to vote, they yeah. could have voted yeah, a lot. Yeah, the people are apathetic, don't care. So if they had, all it would take is 1,800 votes. So are you arguing that their political power might be declining, but economically they have still consolidated their position, and partly because they've consolidated their economic position, they don't need to mobilize it so much to grab political power. Mm -hmm. And so then are you arguing that Japanese-American ethnicity is on the dec decline? So people are... Okay, you know, if you're using ethnicity in a different way than I've been talking about it here. I do clarify in the book that there are these two different ways I use the term. But most, most of the time I'm using it the way I've talked about it here, in terms of... Uh, that's a structural thing. But there is certainly a notion of one could speak of Japanese-American ethnicity in terms of Japanese American identity, culture, social relationship. Those were mobilized as in the elections of Ariyoshi 74, 78. Yeah. But I'm saying at this point, it's not really used to bring the community together to advance the political interest, except at maybe local levels when a candidate is running for uh, office in the legislature or city council, but not necessarily at the uh, level for state offices, congressional offices, you know, that takes a lot more organization. Okay. Uh, Hagen and then Mari, sorry, did you bring your answer? It's okay. Sure. I think the pipe from race to in this case is such a great pipe in the conversation. <laughs> Finding that kind of pipe. And the thesis is very, very easy to accept. But if you try to think, uh, try to theorize a little bit, um, you know, under what conditions that kind of the process occurs? Mm -hmm. And you just talk about mm -hmm. uh, situations and, and changes specific to Hawaii. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'm just wondering if the same kind of change has occurred or is occurring 
you say in Hawaii? I mean, if, if so, mm -hmm. you know, what, what, what other fact, exact factor is contributed to it? Mm -hmm. You mentioned about the Japanese American ascendance in terms of occupation and education and research. That's, that's one dominant factor. Mm -hmm. but I'm, I'm sure there is an insufficient factor. Mm -hmm. uh, there may be several others. So, uh, can, is it because of that? Oh, yeah, so I, I thought about it a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some, some sure. okay. contributing yeah. factors yeah. and try to generalize. Okay, let me, let me mention the title. The initial title was Race and Ethnicity Interpreting Japanese American. But then U.S. Press said, well, you can't use the same title as the series. Title. So I said, from race to ethnicity. But I had the argument in the book, so it wasn't uh, that difficult to come up with. The issue you're raising is one of scale, you know, because the comparison I make is ethnicity is dominant in Hawaii as opposed to race in the continental U.S. There's just no comparison between the entire continental U.S. and Hawaii. That's the reason why race can have this significance, because we're talking a much smaller society. Of course, ethnicity can have this significance in a much smaller society in which the constituent groups themselves are viewed as the most significant ones, like Chinese Americans versus Filipino Americans, Japanese Americans, even Korean Americans. You know? But for the continent as a whole, you're dealing with these huge racial blocks. So, in terms of scale, if you apply the same kind of idea, you might go to San Gabriel Valley, California, you know, where you have different ethnic groups, Asian American, white, uh, Latino, etc., and their ethnicity might be more significant in that kind of lower uh, level of analysis. No? Would you agree? You see what? You no, know, scale is, is one thing, but yeah. of course the most important factor is that if, uh, if the minorities do not experience race-based discrimination or disadvantage, mm -hmm. as in, 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 in Hawaii, after the 1950s or something. So, not only Japanese Americans, but Chinese and, and other, uh, even the Philippines, they not really experience it is the race which determines everything. Uh, then, then they pay attention to something else. Right? So it's a degree of racial discrimination, or the degree of the power of the dominant race. Right. Okay. Okay. But you know, that's one thing. Definitely. Yeah. But you know, as I said, Filipinos, Hawaiians, Samoans, other minorities still are subject to. Racism, discrimination. Uh, it's not as severe as during the pre War II period, you know? but ethnicity still operates against them. It's not as though, because ethnicity is no longer dominant, that we have a much more open society. I, I wouldn't argue that. It, what, it did provide for mobility for. Chinese, Japanese, Koreans to get off the plantation, middle class, professional work, but at the same time, Hawaiians, Filipinos, other minorities, Puerto Ricans, were all on the plantation, didn't have that same kind of experience. And that, become, and that has become much more difficult, as I've been arguing, since my, the 1970s. Hmm? Oh, so Ethnicity still is a barrier. Ethnicity is still a barrier. Yeah. It's just the principle that operates now to limit opportunities. Okay. Um, I'm sure this is part of your analysis, given your other work. But can you talk? Um, a little bit more directly and explicitly about how this parad paradigmatic shift to ethnicity in Hawaii, um, what the effect of that is, not only to the relative downplaying of race, but also indigeneity and settler colonialism, like how this, this, you know, privileging of ethnicity, mm. especially among Japanese Americans, like mm. what that does to their own understanding 
of their relationship to especially the <coughs> ones, but also whites. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think for a lot of Japanese Americans, um, they, they tend to think about the history in Hawaii over the generation largely a success story. I think this might be true of Chinese Americans also. It's very much a model minority kind of view of themselves as succeeding through their own hard work. It's how you, you know, you, how you hear older Japanese Americans talk. Uh, about um, Japanese American history, beginning with the plantation um, generation, and then over the years, over the generation, each one has done better than the other. So even the like the fourth generation, you don't say. Wally Fujiyama used to be on the board of Union. I, I think he's the one that people will say came up with the term the spoiled generation. Well, I, he gave a talk. He talked about oh. It, you guys have it so easy. And he, this was, I think, 30 years ago. I saw a video of that in the Japanese American uh, in Hawaii class. Like, you guys don't have to uh, work hard. You guys don't have to struggle. Hell, just about every Yonsei student I know works part time, put themselves to college. But the older Japanese tend to think in those kinds of ways of success over the generation. So this certainly marginalizes other groups like Hawaiians. Or Filipino Americans, um, when it comes to settler colonialism, you know there's resistance even among non-Japanese Americans to that notion that Candace has shared with me. She's in Concord. so it's not as though this is a, an idea that is widely accepted. I appreciate this distinction between native and settler, but it's not something necessarily that, you know, beyond academics has gained wide acceptance in Hawaii, even among the except even among academics, even in my own department, there's a lot of resistance to that notion that she's advanced. Yes. I enjoyed the talk very much. I was curious and struck by the notion of um, the block voting, the discussion of block voting, how that's kind of dying off. Um, if you say it doesn't cross over in the social um, mm -hmm. party. And in other ethnic categories, you see like a life and economic status sometimes means that they might shift uh, political status or political parties. Right? Mm -hmm. So more wealthy, more conservative um, mm -hmm. in some ways. Mm -hmm. Older, more conservative. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, like, does that happen? Japanese Americans will still tend to vote Democrat, more so than younger ones. Um, I think the rising socioeconomic mobility among Chinese Americans historically has given rise to greater support for the Republican Party. Uh, there used to be a lot more Chinese American Democrats. I mean, if you, if you think symbolically of people like Charles Niju, for example. Huh? Uh, or the head of the Republican Party now, or the whose, whose wife is the sole Republican member in the state house. Uh, I think that's much more noticeable in terms of the, the switch to the Republican Party with rising socioeconomic mobility. It's less the case, I would argue, among Japanese Americans. People would say that younger Japanese Americans tend to vote uh, less for the Democratic Party some support Republicans, but as Brian Taniguchi says, even though they say they support Republicans, they don't necessarily vote. This is true of young people in general in Hawaii. We have the lowest voting percentage among 18 to 29 year olds, 31 percent in the nation. So this is one reason I think Japanese Americans have been able to hold on to power because of the way in which People just don't vote in Hawaii. It just gives an advantage if you can count on the support of members of your own group who tend to vote and register at higher rates than others. The other groups marginalize themselves. However, 
as I also point out, you know, this is the opportunity provided for uh, candidates from the smaller groups. You've got huge blocks of unregistered voters. If you could get them to register vote for you, as Obama did with young people in 2008, this is a way to get yourself elected to office at much less expense than raising campaign funds. Because registering and voting is free. Right. So are you saying David Ige is going to lose? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you this. Is this the tape I would not be surprised if Mark Takai loses. I'm not so sure about Ige. You know, it depends how much money you can raise. And so the Okinawans come through or not. Is the Hawaiian uh, component here uh, we have our uh, Republican friend? Did I do? Yeah, they do. Oh, uh, homeless court? Did you all hear about his proposal for homeless court? It's like his drug court he used to have when he was a judge. Yeah. Huh? To what extent then is the Hawaiian oh. element? Well, you know, uh, Luffy's going to take some votes away. Not just Hawaiian votes, Christian right wing. Yeah. This might create opportunities for you again. He was leading the last poll I saw. I don't know how much. I saw something got 43%. I don't know how much Iona had. I was surprised at that too. He, he's running a kind of like Ariyoshi campaign back in 78. Quiet but effective. Mm -hmm. And then Ariyoshi's suggestion to him, Ige said, was old coffee hours. But Ariyoshi last ran for office in 1982. <laughs> he could win uh, with that kind of strategy 32 years ago. I'm not so sure if that can be successful. But Ige said he was doing the same thing too. All right, so that's all the time we have for today. Uh, join me in thanking um, John Okamura one more time.